Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the first of, I think, five, because there are so many Wednesdays, uh, shows that we're going to be doing around connected teacher, uh, connected educators. Educated month. Yes, <laughs> because not everybody who's an educator is a teacher, but we prefer the teachers here. <laughs> teachers Teaching Teachers. That's a great start. How do you like that? <laughs> so, um, Connected Educators Month um, at uh, Teachers and Teachers, um, and there's there are our Christina Control can tell us how many there are, but there are many many events, and it's very very exciting, and this is just our little piece of it. Um, so we're glad that um, you're listening, and um, really thrilled with the educators who have joined us here. Christina, do you want to kind of put the month into some context for us? Introduce yourself again, please, and then. Just sure. a little bit of context. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking, I was just looking like, well, I don't actually know how many events there are. Um, Karen right. might have sense, but um, I'm Christina Cantrell. I uh, have the great honor of working with many of you um, through the National Writing Project, and um, I always say that, but it's very, very true. And um, yeah, we were. Um, the Connected Educator Month is happening um, October. The Department of Ed said October will be Connected Educator Month. Um, and this is the third year? Is that this right? is the second year. Yeah. Second year. Oh, just and years. last year it was held in August. So if people remember it last year, um, it was held in August before school. And this is, you know, moving it um, to October to see, you know, if that supports people in thinking about being connected and staying connected. Um, so, um, but they're, they're really trying to learn what, what can support teachers in being connected and um, in what ways teachers are thinking about connecting, um, both online as well as offline. And actually, I would, I would go back to saying educate, because I think that um, we especially are interested in both educate, working, uh, connecting educators inside and outside of school um, as part of the Educator Innovator Initiative um, that the National Writing Project's working on, too. So, um, but Connected Educator Month is, um, I know that there's about 200 participating organizations um, and partners who are all hosting their own events. Um, so we're really thrilled um, that you, um, Paul, and your colleagues here have um, decided to host the Teachers Teaching Teachers for Connected Educator Month, and that you'll be you know, here regularly um, every Wednesday night, as you have been for years. And um, that's such a wonderful um, resource. So we wanted, um, so we're thrilled that you're, you're um, doing this and exploring this idea of what it means to be connected. And we've been doing a couple things at the National Writing Project, um, also just kind of exploring what do we actually mean, trying to get underneath, like what do we mean by being connected educators? So I'm looking forward to this conversation. So, you, so you did a that. show, you did a, were you part of the show or you did the show? Sorry, I didn't listen to it yet. Radio? On WP Radio, yeah, when yeah. was that? And how could people listen to that? Yeah, so there is a, um, I think it was September 26th, there was an NWP radio show called Connected Educator Month is Coming. <laughs> and so we sort of took on the same question, you know, what does it actually mean to us to be a connected educator? And um, it was really interesting. I would encourage folks to listen to this. Um, folks from the uh, San Diego Area Writing Project and the Keene University Writing Project in New Jersey. Um, and um, I think it really sort of got at uh, uh, many of the different pieces of being um, a connected educator, both um, in your local communities and in face-to-face, -face, plus on online and in network environments. Um, so I would cool. really encourage that, even though October started already. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great resource. Um, let's um, let's quickly go around and say hi to each other and introduce yourself, because some people may be listening to this who don't know you. Um, and just uh, take up the lead there and say what connected means to you. But I'm also real interested in um, the uh, the next question, which is what difference that makes for your students in some way too. So, somebody want to j jump on that? 
Uh, and Valerie, why don't we just start with you and go across the other way, if you don't mind. Why, thank you. And Karen, um, I'm uh, just so you know, I'm muting some of your typing. But <laughs> please keep typing, because we love... And So if you're not in the chat over there, I, I'm assuming that's where you're typing. I'm at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Uh, please uh, go there. Valerie, welcome. Hi, um, I'm an English teacher from New Orleans, Louisiana, um, and you know I have forgotten what the question was, Paul. Um, I follow the What's love. connected mean to you? <laughs> okay, um, having a transparent classroom, sharing mm-hmm. everything that we do in the classroom, whether it's um, through tweeting or blogging or wikiing or whatever. Um, I just really think it's important that we have a, a digital presence, and I help my kids share the good work, the mediocre work, um, and introducing what I do to other teachers and learning from them what it is that they do for me and my kids. Nice quick introduction. Thanks. We'll get back to you. Though. Sherry. Uh, this is Sherry Edwards, and I teach in a very rural public school school in North Washington, uh, middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grades, and uh, connected to me means um, uh, finding resources, people, ideas, strategies that um, expand and help all of us grow together, and that includes my students. Since we're in such a rural area, it's, it's really important that they can build understanding of their people through the connections we have with our wikis, blogs, etc. So that's connected. And um, I, I, I will say very briefly, I, I now I've been um, trying to open, have been now four weeks, three and a half weeks, whatever it is, um, opening a, a 6 through 12, and one of the things that we have agreed on the staff about is agreements and, and one of the and we're trying to make it really clear and simple um, and some, we're messing around with this we're not it's not clear yet but one of the things that so we want to ask kids to be here to be real um, and the third one we came up with was is be connected and then be great um, which is uh, we're quoting Jay-Z for the be great but <laughs> And not the whole quote. But <laughs> the um, if you know, but the um, so anyway, so that made me think about connected, and and it came up in my in in, in our planning because it was about young people um, solving problems by connecting with adults in the school. But I and but but certainly connecting with with mentors and and making those kinds of connections is is one of the things that all this means to me. So that's a brief introduction. Karen. Oh, you have to unmute. Hi, I'm here. There you go. Good. Hi, I'm Karen Fassenpower, and <laughs> I too am in a very rural area and work mostly with um, other educators. And if I didn't have all the connections I have, I wouldn't be able to do the work I do, and I wouldn't have so many great friends and resources and information. So being a connected educator is really important to me, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Joe? Um, okay, Joe Paraiso. I'm teaching in Oakland, 12th grade. Um, and uh, being connected, I, I guess for right now what it means for me is is being fearless about putting everything out there to the world. Um, I guess it, it just, it's, for my for myself and for my students right now, especially through blogging, it's, what we love is like, I, I, rediscovering our humanity. So it's kind of like, we love talking about diversity, and for my kiddos that's really important. Um, but also when they when they form connections with other students from far away, like New Orleans, I, it's like, it's a way to find out what we have in common. And that's that's important. And I mean, just given where I teach, um, the virtual space has been really liberating for a lot of the kids because they don't go outside. Um, it's it, it can be, you know, it can be a little bit, it can be dangerous for a lot. So right now, a lot of them see it as a way to connect to the outside, outside world. Um, from the, the safety of school, 
or the safety of home. But they can still be connected, which is great. So when they don't go outside, are they playing games? Largely, do you think, or what are Online, they? or... Yeah, or what are they doing? Yeah. I'm saying that, that a lot of them, you know, they go straight home, or um, it's just you don't hang out on the streets. You just don't do that. Um, so they're, you know, giving them the reason to, to stay at home and do work, and then, you know, you provide that space for them to be doing it online as well. It's, 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 it's a way for them to feel like they're not isolated in Oakland. Because um, it can feel that way. A lot of the kids never leave Oakland. Um, mm. So that's what I mean. Like, yes, and they're gaming a lot online, yes. <laughs> Which is my new goal this year, is to I'll figure out how I can start gaming with them online. Because I, I know nothing. Nothing mm. about gaming, so. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one, of my, one of my sixth graders um, in his bio described, um, and we as the staff looked at this piece, um, described how when he plays basketball um, on just in the, in the street, he imagines that he's doing all these moves like he's in a game, right? <laughs> so um, and then, but then it it gets confusing because he says he doesn't play outside so much. Is was what made your comment made me think of that, and he does a lot of the um, imagination when he's playing video games. Mm -hmm. But then he goes back to the to to the street stuff and says that he tries the video stuff in the street, uh -huh. um, and I really do think he was kind of telling us how he learns, you know, yeah. so it was a really interesting yeah. piece to think about all that. Yeah. Very cool. Joanne, welcome back, second week in a row, thank you yeah. for joining us. I'm Joanne Fetcher, <laughs> and I teach in Green Bay, Wisconsin, I'm actually in a suburb of Green Bay, Howard Swamico, and eighth grade. Connected to me, I'm one of my goals has been for the past couple of years is just trying to get my kids to um, be connected outside of my classroom, outside of our building with other kids, and I've um, found youth voices. So that has just been great the past couple of weeks. Um, we were building our bios, and last last week we started commenting, um, and so I'm excited to have the kids, um, you know, get to meet with some of the other kids on youth voices. So. Um, this is the first time we've been able to reach out of our classroom, so I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, I saw some of those bios. Oh, how's the commenting gone? Because I haven't, it's hard to track. I, um, like, I started with a general discussion guide, so I'm, I'm going to work with that, to, and we're going to look at what are some of the key components before I let them use their own voice and just make sure they're understanding what's important when commenting. But what I've really liked about the bios is because they know I'm not the original audience, that it's other kids, I've really learned a lot about them in their bios. They were more authentic and more um, telling, so it was pretty neat to read their bios. Mm -hmm. Paul? Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if people are joining us for the first time, if maybe you or someone else could uh, tell describe what oh. Youth Voices is, because many of you have referred to it already, so... I know that this community... That's a great... Chris Sloan can do that. Go ahead, Chris. Introduce yourself and try that. And then okay. I'll jump in if you miss anything. Sure. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, my name's Chris Sloan, and I teach English and Media High School at uh, Judge Morial in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and so um, I guess first we were talking about connected educators, but now um, I guess one example of Connected Educators Month for me would be uh, Youth Voices, which is a place where students discuss their um, digital creations um, and and um, whatever else is on their mind uh, in a community, primarily of National Writing Project teachers and their classes, um, and it's been going on for nearly a decade there. Um, but I guess you know when I think about Connected Educator Month, I guess I'm thinking you know just just because we are doesn't mean we are. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, we have all these connections, and um, my students are, are pretty savvy with their connection. Well, they're connected. Um, but then sometimes when I look at our collaborations, like Let's Stick with Youth Voices, um, a lot of times we don't make the most of those connections, and I think that's what I'm trying to work on this year, is that um, trying to get them away from shouts in a crowd 
Um, they can YouTube, they can, you know, um, do a lot of stuff on Facebook, and they tumble and they tweet and they do a lot of stuff. But I don't know that they really um, construct a lot of knowledge um, in these spaces. And I don't know that even, you know, me as their teacher, I don't know that we do enough to, um, you know, capitalize on the affordances of the connections we have. So that's something I'm working on these days. So that's one thing Youth Voices is. It's an ongoing community working on things, <laughs> just to, that, uh, which is which is important um, to say. But and and it is a, so. It is a social network um, that uh, I I always say a dozen, but the, the numbers are always a little fuzzy because. We're, but I, there are about a dozen um, schools in New York City um, that are on the site and. By schools, I mean individual teachers, probably, um, in most cases. And there are about a dozen um, schools and teachers throughout the United States. So it's not a massive community. And there, there's actually a school in Panama <laughs> that's jumped on recently. Um, so, anyway, so yeah, it's but but it's it's way open to anybody um, to be able to post. It's it's openly networked. It's um, uh, we encourage. Uh, teachers to have students do personal inquiry and because um, that kind of looks best on the site when it's like one assignment and everybody's done the same assignment. That's okay. You can jump in that way. But um, but moving toward more personal inquiry is, is sort of what we think about. Um, so there's some definitions. Um, and why don't well, we... Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Add to it, Christina, please. Well, I just didn't want to skip over my turn because I did want to say that no. um, I do think teachers teacher, teaching teachers to me is a, a really strong example of um, some of the power of these tools to connect educators. And what I've been watching you guys do on these shows week by week is come together to talk about youth voices and the curriculums in your own classrooms and then co-constructing some ways for your classrooms to connect and your students to connect. And to me, that's a really powerful example of being a connected educator and some of the potential of it um, and the leadership that you all have taken in that, too. So I just, you know, in terms of Connected Educator Month, I think of you all, actually. <laughs> and um, then how can I develop my own practices to be, you know, as sort of inquiry rich and collaborative and sort of constantly discussing and being open with other colleagues about what I'm working on, I think is really powerful example. Thank you. Uh, let's get Alan in here. Alan, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Alan, oh, okay. thank you very much, Paul. I, I think we talked a couple of years ago, maybe it was a show talking about the Horizon Project. I'm Alan Levine, and... Um, I'm a resident of the web is about all I have to say. Um, I've connected. I recently got to visit Karen, so it's exciting to see her on her video. I was in her house <laughs> just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I live in a little town called Strawberry, Arizona, and I've been working about, uh, I hate to say, 20 years on the web, uh, kind of as a both a developer and a practitioner. I've done some online teaching, and for the last couple of years I've been involved with them. Um, an open storytelling course called uh, DS106, mm -hmm. uh, which I've taught both in person. Well, thank you, Christine, and um, <laughs> online. And actually, right now, we have a version of it, which I am officially not teaching. In fact, no one is teaching. It is a completely wide open, and we're more or less republishing previous syllabi, and people are doing it on their own. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, obviously, the idea of connection, as, as are all of you. Um, mainly, to me, in the matter at which the web itself uh, fundamentally connects in kind of this distributed pattern. So um, a hallmark of the way we run DS106 is every participant publishes in their own space. So um, a lot of you are doing blogging with your students and finding it really important that students create a space of their own, and that's what we do in DS106. And I'm just starting to come up with an idea for a project I, I have to pitch like within a month and it's very vague right now but um, I'll be looking for partners who want to sort of do a DS 106 just type thing um, as well as I I don't even know what to call this but I, I want to create an organization that has no organization <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll just leave it at that 
Awesome. And def definitely, um, I know Karen recommended it. I do want to talk to some people from the National Writing Project because um, there's a lot of overlap with, um, I think, of what we've been doing. Cool. So, uh, Alan, is, is, is the work you do, is it mainly post-secondary or...? Uh, primarily, I mean, most of my, my work has been in, in higher education, although um, uh, DS-106 crosses lines, so uh, I did um, some work in uh, March. I visited some uh, mostly uh, international schools in Japan and Singapore, and basically I was doing our, um, I was doing the four icon challenge with second graders, and I was doing five card flicker stars with fifth graders. And um, I have to say, that fifth grade group in Yokohama, <laughs> Um, they were the best group I've ever seen do this exercise, hand down, uh, just because of their sheer exuberance, energy, can, and creativity. I'm not familiar exactly with what that is. I, can you oh. can you break? Can you say what it looked like a little bit? Uh, basically, it's it's a website I came up with a couple years ago um, to do visual story um, exercises. <laughs> And you're dealt five random images from Flickr based on the tag, and you have to pick one to start your story. And then you get five new ones, and then you have to do another one. So you have to piece together these disparate pieces of a photo, and then at the end you sort of try to write how you bridge those together. Um, so it, it's a simple uh, activity in storytelling from media that you don't really know until you see them. And I can put the URL into the chat when I, I can't talk yeah. and type at the same time. <laughs> Oh, Sherry's on. <laughs> That's good. Sherry's <laughs> on it already. Got it. <laughs> Thank you, yep, Sherry. That's yep, good. I got it for you. They're great. The kids love to do those. You do them too, Sherry? Yes, we did some last year, and uh, we'll be starting again this year. So but what do you do? You you, you t use a use a um a keyword and and you search that in Flickr. Uh, yeah, I, I have it set up that there's um, I, there's a default thing, so to look for anything tagged as five card flicker to get in the mm -hmm. pool. Uh, but I've worked with groups, so if you have a group or a class who wants to create um, your own pool of images, you know, I've worked with um, Clarence Fisher students um, and, and Heather Durnan students. Um, uh, so you know, if you have specific sets of, of pictures you want to draw together, but it's just pulling them randomly um, instead of everything in Flickr, you know, wide open. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to talk about five card flicker, but it just. I, well, I asked him, so <laughs> that's, that's what we do on this show. We just do whatever we want. So, <laughs> I, uh, so, and, and, and I like that. Else. And, and honestly, th I mean, that thing was not my idea. Um, it's based upon an activity mm -hmm. that uh, Scott McLeod came up based upon the old Nancy cartoons. Um, and a colleague of mine had shown uh, a website that did it. And then I pitched that idea. And to me, this idea, we call it riffing where you sort of take someone's idea, you just put a little twist on it, or you just redo it. Uh, I mean, to me, that is the whole, the whole fundamental genetic nature of the Internet, that it's, it's completely open as to what we can pick and, and remix, and we can just come up with these new ideas based upon someone else's. Mm -hmm. So, I, I um, and I'd love for others to say... What you're thinking about this when you when you mentioned that uh, your sort sort of approach and then we can is to have have people have their own spaces. We've actually thought differently about that. <laughs> um, just and and I've I've been searching here to think about some some issue that we can actually talk about and push back with each other about. So um, so when we've done that in K through 12, some of the issues. That have come up are you know the class ends, the semester ends, and what do we do with that you know blog, and then you know so a way to kind of um, and one of the things that's nice about Youth Voices at this point is that even though Joanne's um, students up in Wisconsin probably commented on students who aren't on Youth Voices anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> this week, th there's still a body of sort of young youth voices <laughs> there that that kind of interact with each other. So it's not great, but it's kind of interesting to have mm -hmm. that. So I just wanted to, to kind of explore a little bit. And Valerie, you've done some exploration with your own blogs. Like the advantages of that and the advantages of being in a community like Youth Voices. Anybody want to jump on that besides Alan and me <laughs> first? And then we can get oh. back to it. Well, yeah. well, we've... 
We kid blogs, and that has the comment for kids hashtag built in when you tweet those, and so people um, see that tweet and then can go comment on it. But I. But does it happen? I think <laughs> that it's. Yeah, it does. It does okay. happen, yeah. and um, and then of course the students need to comment somewhere else, or if they've left their link, they. You know, there's a reciprocal relationship there. But I think that blogging works better if you have, like, maybe three or four schools that are kind of working together so that for sure you have that conversation going, that interaction. Because if you just have just your individual blogs, the connection is sometimes few and far between, is what I found for, for kids anyway. I think Youth Voices allows that connection. You know, um, you can put like a face onto the World Wide Web and and public access and who your online friends and buddies are, and you know, it it, it widens up the world, but it still makes it smaller and manageable where you know you've got a specific group of kids to focus on. So I think we're going to do both. Um, my kids will have their Weebly for their outside online e-portfolio, but I still want them to be able to form a connection within the Youth Voices community because I really think that that's important for them to be able to build a relationship. I mean, it goes back to what Joe said. As, as much as different as, as Oakland is from New Orleans, you know, these kids are really still the same. And one of my first experiences with connecting my kids online was with a classroom with Germany and a classroom with New York. And it's just really funny how the kids realized they were listening to some of the same music. <laughs> and it just really shocked them to death for them to think about New York kids listening to their music. And then it was like, wait, these kids from Germany have heard of, you know, Jay-Z or whatever. So I think Youth Voices allows us to open up the world for them in a manageable slice, though, mm -hmm. you know. And, Joe, you've had questions, or, or you've done both, right, to some degree? Done both what? Uh, <laughs> individual blogging, and now you're on Youth Voices. And yeah, we did, yeah. you thought about yeah. this question? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, for us, because we're trying to spread the, the word of Youth Voices, I mean, we're trying to have other kids, I mean, other schools locally partner with us, because uh, as much as I do love partnering with, you know, and having my kids here from kids from Louisiana and New York, Panama, that's, I, that's, that's for them to be able to see the world that way. There's also the part where Oakland really, our kids need to talk to each other, um, because we're so divided west, north, east. Um, the territories are so divided too. It's just to be able to encourage a dialogue where you know I've partnered up with other teachers that are currently not on Youth Voices. People are asking, uh, people are looking, but you know I'd love to see a couple more schools in Oakland, some of the Flatland schools partner with me. I think that would be the uh, really valuable for us this year, um, especially we're, we're you know we're we're schools that are going through the same thing in the same area um, right now, and I think that we need that dialogue between our kids. Um, yeah, so that's what we're gonna. That's I think what connected is gonna look like for us this year, is 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 trying to build up more of the youth voice in in our partner schools, just you know down the block. That makes sense for me too, because um, you know, like some of the if you leave it pretty interest driven, you know, write about what you're really interested in. Um, a lot of what my students are interested in are kind of um, Primarily local or kind of regional kinds of things, and so there are these. Chris, I've got to jump in on that and say, you know, the question: What do you do when you see a, when you encounter a bear? My kids <laughs> have never have never asked themselves. <laughs> <I'm> never asked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but go ahead. Right. So you know, like perhaps there may be, uh, you know, hard to <laughs> for you guys to connect to my guys who are, you know, really scared about bears because he's out there quite a bit. Um, <laughs> You know, but um, I guess on those ones that are national kinds of things, our kids have found some common ground. But I think that's part of 
my issue, Joe, is that um, they can um, write so often, like about bears or whatever, and that's pretty cool. And I think that's you know, like the Oakland kids or New York City kids would probably find that fascinating. But then, is it easy to talk about and and you know connect over that? It's not as easy. Alan, do you want to come back on this? <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 honestly, I, I am against singular solutions. So I, I yeah, think <laughs> whatever ways that they were connected, and obviously um, in many cases it makes sense to, to go to something like Youth Voices. So I, I'm not saying that the, the way we've done it is primarily best. And, and to me, mm -hmm. again, you know, I think about the way the Internet is so benign to certain platforms. The whole idea is uh, an environment, an ecosystem for people to connect in, in many ways. So uh, I'm all for that. And, you know, we, we do a, a myriad. So the, the foundation of DS-106, as you know, originally taught, was that um, we want students, um, again, who are, you know, mostly undergraduate um, university college students to sort of begin to develop their online persona instead of letting the um, the hosted entities, the Facebooks, the Googles, um, define who they are. So mm -hmm. um, kids in first grade aren't at that stage yet. They're you know the, you know maybe they are in some places, but you know this is the chance in K twelve to sort of begin um, dabbling in various levels of immersion into this. And perhaps by high school, in some places, kids are ready to start asserting. Um, their their digital presence and and maybe not so I think it's twelve years worth of exploring connectivity uh, and I'll, I'm all for it. One of my students came in and she said, "Look, I've got nine years of YouTube history that I'm not very proud of. Um, <laughs> it was my playfulness. It was my youth. I want to start building something new." And she could choose to do that, and that was the the place that, that we allowed to do. So I, I'm all for these multiple ways that people can um, do this connectivity. As long as they're doing it, you know, as long as there's ways to do it. So, you know, in, in my world, which is basically what's inside my stupid fat head, um, like just the more ways and opportunities that we can create this serendipity uh, and connectionness, you know, and I just, I just loved, you know, listening to Valerie's description. Like, I just figured I'd connect with students in Germany. Um, I just love that. That's beautiful. And, and that's the spontaneity and the serendipity of the internet, which has been magical for me forever, well, at least for the last 20 years. Karen, do you have anything to add, or is there anything in the chat room, Dad? I just want to check it yeah, out. you know, I was just thinking about a lot of the a lot of the reasons that I think having your own domain or having your own space is important. I think Youth Voices leads up to that. Like one thing is. It, it, when I've worked with students on other blogging platforms and sort of the most notably like a district hosted one, almost always at the end of the year all the stuff goes away. And so that, that's one of the challenges with with a hosted service. And Youth Voices, I mean it's there and you can see kids sort of moving year to year. But I think even the most important one is just developing that sense of identity that Alan was talking about and feeling you know, feeling ownership for your work and ownership for your ideas and being out there. And I think, you know, Youth Voices is all about that. And and however it's however it's developed, the community at Youth Voices, I mean the youth are in charge and they're saying what they want to say and there's clearly not anybody sort of drawing a lot of boxes <laughs> around where they are. And that's a big part of the idea of having your own domain or your own space is sort of you know, it being yours. And I think Youth Voices is a really nice sort of lead into that from a value standpoint. And I think um, it's also um, kind of cross-platform fluency or something that yeah. you know, it's important for them to know the, the community ethos, let's yeah. say, of a Youth Voices versus when I have my own, like I have photographers who have their own, you know, portfolio slash website, and that's kind of showing another dimension of their learning. And yet, you know, like their Twitter is kind of a different take on their personality. And so I know it's that distributed um, identity idea, but I think it's also being fluent in different spaces seems like a good idea right now. Well, it seems like a good idea to, I mean, I'm just thinking about my own personal journey around that, Chris, and how I'm always trying to figure it out at, at myself as an adult and as an educator. And, at, you know, I think that, um, I think that's really important, both the, 
communities and different communities have these different ethoses and practices that develop and and then you also have your own spaces and individually you can connect. I do think it's that rich ecosystem that Alan's talking about and I feel like um, for many of us we really are all learning that right now too, you know, and there's new communities form and we have to sort of newly learn that, you know. Um, yeah, I was I was really impressed when uh, I was talking to a lot of middle school kids uh, over there in Asia to to kind of listen to where they're they're putting their energy. It's not all as you probably know, it's not all Facebook. So there's this interesting core group of kids who find Tumblr really interesting, and I've heard that mentioned. Uh, a lot of them Instagram and and Pinterest. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of narrow channels to find people with similar interest to do it in, in variable ways. And even two kids are talked about Reddit, you know. So um, <laughs> so I, I, I like that, that the kids are exploring the, these different um, communities that we don't always have time to sort of fully sort out, but I, I think we need to keep our antenna up um, as to where they're putting their, their personal interest. And, and I just want to get back to the bears a little bit. Because <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to Alaska for the first time on Sunday. So, so well, what do you do? I don't know. You just want to know what to do, right? <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I know the common well. folklore, but um, I'm looking to, to seek my uh, new information all the time. So what do you think? Is there an uh, answer yet? Go ahead. Oh. Sherry, go ahead. Oh. Um, uh, we're a Google Apps school, so in eighth grade, as they turn 13, um, we make sure that, that they stand all the aspects of digital citizenship and and the use of Google Apps because when our school district, they go to a different school district, and so we send home a form for the parents to, to allow them to create their own Gmail account, so that when they leave our school, they'll have access you know to that the possibilities there and you know we even have kids at the end of the year um, calling in on Google Hangout to see the lesson because they're at home sick so you know they're really they start their own blogs in a, a portfolio and so they they have those connections with each other to form study groups uh, for high school, if they do that, but it's a goal. So we really try to help them develop that positive personal space, and we really focus on every day, you know, digital citizenship and and creating that that path that people can follow you, and that is a positive one. You know, um, the uh, we're a Google App School too, and our Let's say this carefully. Our um, middle school students are all overage students, so we're all on Google Plus, um, and um, and the t and trying to figure out what students um, share on in their Google Plus communities and what they're going to share on Youth Voices is like a really good problem, right? And it gets back to what Christina was saying. Like we all kind of figure out what to share where, and um, it's an interesting, wonderful problem for kids to have and for teachers to be dealing with. But but it should be talked about because mm -hmm. like we could use these we could use any of these tools in any different way, right? Almost. Mm -hmm. um, so which so we just sort of make social decisions, I think. That you know, so it needs to be a little more formal, a little more together before it goes up in youth voices and the informal stuff goes on Google Plus. But that's not necessarily true. You know, <laughs> that's just Kind of our social decision in the school to make that decision, but anyway, so it seems like that's part of what um, learning to be a connected person in our society is about: figuring out where to post things. Right. <laughs> Any thoughts? So I, let me let me um see if we can shift to uh, and and ask if there's any I in mean, because I'm really interested. What makes uh, these webcasts more interesting in some way is if we can not not like we don't have to disagree with each other, but but where are some of the tensions um, in in this whole thing? Yeah, the, the web's great, but um, you know where where are we running into tensions issues around some of the connected educator rhetoric and reality? Let's put it that way. <laughs> Maybe. I think, yeah, I think there's a tension in a lot of schools with how 
how connected teachers are because of administration directives about particularly as being connected implies like sort of openness and being out there and I think there's both explicit and implicit directives not to do that you know on the other hand I feel like it's I feel like it's almost like an equity issue that to not be connected as an educator you're at such a huge disadvantage it's a professional issue and I think there's just a lot of tension around that in in with a lot of teachers and districts that I work with anyway anybody want to speak to that or something else <laughs> Well, I also um, and sometimes. Go ahead, Sherry. Sure. No, go ahead. Mm, I it was like a half form thought. I was, I was just going to say a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to say Sherry then. You go, go Sherry. <laughs> you guys are so polite. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that you know a lot of schools don't have technology. The teachers don't have access, and so. Sometimes we expect of teachers things that they're not able to do because they just don't have their own or uh, in their within their classroom. So that's an issue. And at our school, I just got news today that we may finally be getting um, a faster internet connection. Right now, we're just on T1, so <laughs> it's really slow. So I think um, some people would want to. Once got to see what it could do, but if they don't have it in their classroom to use, it makes it hard for them to be connected to see the benefits. Jerry, do you think there are ways to be connected with not, I mean, not necessarily online, but like in a connected learning sort of framework, right? You, it's it's sort of about a participatory and a production-centered environment. And I think a lot of it we've learned from the web, or like we've been reminded uh, from the web. But um, I just wonder, like, how we can sort of promote some of some of the ideas that and so, about uh, some of what we learned about being connected, even when we're not actually actually online. You know, so it's just a yeah, just a thought. Yeah, I think what you're perhaps you're getting at there is that in many schools we're, we're you know the door and we're in our classroom. Yeah, sort and so build building that openness and having the time to collaborate or taking the time you know making that time to work together and to share openly what you're doing, and that of course goes back to you know administration wanting you to work actually work together. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And that is what we're trying to work on at our school is, you know, working together in, in grade band teams. I'm trying to get them, the teachers, to use the Google apps because um, the students love in my classroom and for use in, with other teachers, but the teachers actually are not, are not using it. So, yeah. so I, yeah, your point is, is well taken is that. Uh, we are from a, a, a situation where teachers can just close the door and be isolated, but, but the world has changed and um, we need to be more connected and, and uh, expand and share more. At least that's, that's how I am. <laughs> I like, I, if I share with someone, they're going to say, oh, how about doing it this way? And I go, oh. Okay, you know it's it's a great way to be better at what I do by sharing. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sherry, you're such a great example of like all the benefits people can get from being connected, and you just do such a nice job of that. I'm wondering. I heard someone make a statement today in in context of this connected educator stuff that sort of all of the um, I have to say excuses of sort of why this stuff isn't happening, ranging from state guidelines about what is PD, and this was in a this was in a conversation about how do we give formal credit for things like what we're doing right now? Because this is, I think, most of us would probably say this is better PD than most sort of formal PD. 
So how do we make that a part of it? And and the and you know one of the questions that comes up is well what their state the state guidelines for salary points and recertification are you know put us in a box. And so ranging from that level all the way to teachers don't have enough technology in their classroom. The statement was made was that that was kind of an excuse for people not coming up with creative solutions to these issues. And I'm curious I'm curious about reactions to that. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Oh, uh, did I say that? Um, you laughed. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I've heard the argument because I mean, oh, you know, we have the range of, of resource issues in different schools. The distribution of funding. Hi, honey. My daughter. Sorry. Um, we have the distribution of funding issue between the schools. And go ahead. Go ahead. Look at their It's beautiful. Okay. Um, and so. <laughs> And, Can and we see so two? I, yeah, sure. you could say hi to us. Yeah. No, no, you'll you you never get her off. The never get her off. Okay, <laughs> sorry. She's Resource a, issues. Go ahead. Resource. Okay. So yeah, I've heard it so many times, and then that's what pushed me in the end. I was, I just had to, you know, we have an, had a, had an outdated electronics policy that just didn't speak to the whole idea of going, you know, increasing the kids' digital literacy skills. If you don't let them use the, the tools, then how are they supposed to do that? Um, so that was where the, the whole lab issue, not having a computer lab, so then I default and become innovative and say, hey, okay, we all use the phones. And you just have to do it. Um, not everyone has one, but a majority of them did. And, and we just started coming up with computer lab combo plus phones equal the entire class can go virtual. Great. Um, it's been when I have, a lot, I do have teachers on staff and, and across schools that that they they are not ready to take the leap into and and what that means and and so then partnering with those classrooms where I go public if my kids are connecting with another classroom and that teacher is not yet ready to go that direction uh, then I it's my role I can model what that looks like to go public with the work and have the kids talk about the process and then you know you just I feel like I'm kind of pulling some folks and I have some folks that are really excited um, so I'm blessed in that respect. But the innovation part, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, the best inventions came from, from urgent need. And so right now, my kids are probably the best inventors with how to get their work to me. I mean, we, we take pictures of the work, so then they send it to me by text because they don't have internet to uh, send me a Google. You know, we have to just come up with creative ways. And it's really fun to get the, to tell the kids, no more excuses. You can't tell me you can't go to the library. All these things, you know, and figure out how to get the work to me. And you would, just being surprised at what the kids will do is, is I'm surprised at sometimes what the grown-ups are not doing and being that creative. So, yes, but I, I said that. I said that. Yes. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, one of the things that, that as teachers we've often said is, like, the kids can get on Facebook. They can get on to do schoolwork. And it's just, you know, I said in the chat, like, equity doesn't have to be the exact same thing for every no. person. It's finding Never. what works for people. But I feel like in a classroom, I can say that to kids, but I feel like that's hard to say to teachers. And I wonder, is that fair? I mean, I hear Sherry's point that not everybody has access. But I think, I feel like everybody has some kind of access or can make access or do it on their phone or whatever if they want to. Is that fair to say to teachers or not? I think it's fair to say to teachers if you can show them how, how you might have done it yourself. I think that you, you've got to be able to, sh to, to ex share that. I mean, that's exactly what I'm trying to do now is mm -hmm. if teachers see this, then then they're more convinced. So I think that it's fair to say it if, if you yourself have become, you know, that model of innovation and, and, and you've just tried different weird things and they and, and you're also very public about that. Um, yeah. I was yeah, wondering I like if that. Joanne wants to give us a report from Wisconsin. What's what's resource and access like up there, if if I'm saying the question correctly, but I, I'm feeling kind of really lucky <laughs> because we have um, Every student, um, we had partnered with Apple, and we have lease iPad. Who's that? No, so I'm just playing. Yeah, yeah. I thought you I'm didn't just... hear me. <laughs> <laughs> and we lease iPads for K-8, and our high school has Max. So we're 24-7 for the kids. Um, so they take them home. They check them out at the beginning of the year, and then in May they'll return them. Mm -hmm. So last year, though, my classroom looked a lot like... Um, what you were describing before where we had a mix of iPads, we had a mix of netbooks, and 
some kids had their phones. So we're just our first year into where every teacher and every student has a device. So we also have um, a learning management system that we're kind of pushing through and working through. Schoology, kind of similar, like Edmodo, if you're familiar with that. But it's a it's a nice way where all kids can go to their courses and to one place. And we're just starting to build that. So um, we're really lucky, and we have um, you know staff that are there to help support the teachers along the way. So to what degree it does a classroom like you described last year, where things got pieced together, kind of inspire what you got this year? Well, it was definitely driven by teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, it was the inequity where if a teacher was motivated to have their kids bring in their own devices and um, you know check out the computers and be on top of the game compared to maybe somebody else who, well, I only get the, the devices once every three weeks. Um, it was the inequity that brought the teachers together to, we pitched a campaign to our district administration and um, it was just like all the stars aligned and somebody was um, in the district office had the know-how to make it happen and they actually came from our middle school is where it started. So. Um, and it got district-wide. Yeah, that's a cool story. Have you written about that anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we should. We're kind of still in, like, mm -hmm. taking deep breaths I and think, everything. Kind of like, be yeah. careful what you wish for. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. now we have a whole slew of other things. But it's a great story of leadership, right? I mean... Yeah, and it really mm -hmm. did come from the teachers. So, mm -hmm. pretty cool. So you can put that on your own blog because we're supporting that, and you can put it on Digital Wiz. Yeah. Just to say uh, that. I'm kind of curious about that same question with Valerie, though, because um, you know I'd like to connect with mm -hmm. your students. And how is connectivity and all that stuff for you? I have partnered up with a teacher who's willing to give up her lab on the non-teaching period so I can say that I can commit to a couple times a week one period in the lab but other than that there's no you know I, we've got new laptops then but I'm told we can't use them I'm told that the labs that the the desktops we have in the lab they're not all usable I mean it's just like excuse after excuse after excuse and I was willing last year to get into trouble using digital phones. I mean, using phones and all. But we've gotten a new principal this year, and she is just really not going for it to the point that she tells us we can't use our computers and stuff during PD. And it just really blows my mind where it's like... Is she it, interim acting, by the way? Is she... No, I'm sorry. It's, to say it's she's her not. job on the line. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, and 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 I and I imagine that that's what it is, you know. But my whole thing, though, really is if it's worth me writing something down, why would I not do it digitally and share it with the world? I mean, if you're saying something important, then say it. Let me share it. Don't you know? Require me to take. I don't. I don't even carry pens. <laughs> I don't carry, you know, paper. You know, I mean, I thought I did good when I got my little mini iPad because now I've got a smaller, you know, computer type thing that I can carry around and take notes on. So, I mean, I'm lucky that with this teacher, she's willing to give up her space a couple times and, you know, we'll be able to post on Youth Voices and stuff and on their Weeblies and stuff that way but if it wasn't for her I don't and I'm conf I'm really I'm confused it baffles my mind mm. you know it's like how can we not especially when I started off five years ago at a school that was one-to-one -one laptops mm. you know so it's like they suckered me in and got me spoiled and then they snatched all my toys yeah. away yeah that would be hard <laughs> you know I think that we didn't purchase we we are leasing everything um, and this isn't new budget money. We had to make a lot of budget cuts, and we did a lot with our printers and printing because we moved everything to the cloud. Um, we did a lot of cuts in other areas, 
and the students um, to get their iPad they're leasing it for thirty five dollars so I, I don't think that's a lot to ask and the high schoolers are leasing their uh, Macs for like seventy seventy five dollars mm -hmm. so it really was creative budgeting and reallocating of the money we already had and then the partnership with Apple that you know made this happen for the one to one it's a, I, I think um, hearing all that leadership and creative use of stuff is really interesting and I'd love to go more. Um, I, I think we should kind of go around though and respect our time and get the last thoughts um, for this hour and or whatever you're thinking around. It doesn't have to be last thoughts. Um, so Alan, would you start us off with that? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's interesting because I mean to me like if I judged every, the whole school situation around the world by my interactions, I would think <laughs> this is an amazing time. And uh, I was at a, um, uh, at a conference last week, and this woman spoke with her frustration about how her kids spent all their summer doing all these projects on their own, being highly connected, and they walk into school, and it's like the light's going out. And I just wonder about, mm -hmm. like, the, the idea about the future being unevenly distributed and, and so is the innovation and the connectedness. Um, you know, uh, to, to me, like, I hear everything going on here in this conversation as being all the stuff to feel optimistic about. So sometimes it's hard to get my hands around this whole picture. And, and I guess my, my sort of curiosity is, like, um, where are we at in terms of, like, people making that first step? Because you all have done this. You're all out there doing this already. You've gotten the motivation under your skin to do this. Like, um, how high is that hurdle now for people to take that, that first step into being uh, connected? Great question. Chris Sloan. Well, Thanks, Alan. Um, I guess that's kind of a segue into what I was thinking, and that is, you know, without any high-tech wizardry, just, you know, just trying to have discussions with other students and and you know like I said in the beginning just kind of capitalize on the affordances of what's already there is is where I am right now and try to do that better yeah I'm gonna go out of order and cuz cuz my thought is related to what you said earlier and and um, the uh, serendipity of the web and everything is is exciting but to what degree are we doing parallel play and not constructing knowledge together? Um, I think I think that's a, an important question for us to return to at some point, and that's going to be my last question. <laughs> but Christina, uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. It takes me in a different direction. But what I was actually thinking about was sort of practice, and to Alan's question and Sherry, you were reminding me of it. It's like that practice of sharing what you're doing and then asking others for feedback and 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 part of that is just practicing being open and I feel like not open at every single moment but open at sort of key moments and sort of thinking about how can I increasingly be slightly more open so I can be slightly more connected so it's just sort of a question I think about and you know have learned to continue to think about and to practice and it takes practice for me <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. And and next week's show is going to be about open, connected uh, sharing yeah. of curriculum. So nice segue there. <laughs> Joanne, thanks for sharing so much tonight. Yep. Any um, last thoughts? Yeah, just I'm just excited to see and hear what everybody's doing and get some direction that I got last week while commenting on youth voices. It really helped the kids. Um, and I just feel like they've already made you know, some connections with kids that I'm hoping that are on, or maybe they're not on Youth Voices, but uh, we're just excited. It'll, it'll still happen, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. we're working on the commenting, but um, I'm just excited to keep going with that. Cool. And if you, if you look at Joe's student stuff, and Joe, I don't think, um, speaking of, well, anyway, I don't know if there is a template for what you ask students to do, or if we know where the, the assignment is, but could you... I know you get to do your own last thought, but answer this question too. <laughs> what, what did you ask your students to do? Because it's a really quick, simple assignment, I think. 
Um, I asked, that question. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just asked. I gave them five prompts for their senior project. That was about personal connection to their topic. What was their inspiration? Um, I on the chat. I just put the link to my website for the class, and under the senior project tab is all the. That's where all I I put everything that they get. So. Um, and last thought, I don't know, I, again, I'm trying to spread youth voices or any such dialogue forum for, for the teachers like within my own school. That's where I'm at right now because I have a lot of very interested folks. So I'd like to capitalize on that and experiment on them. Sounds good to us. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Karen. Okay. Um, wait, oh, wait. hi, there. Oh, say hello. <laughs> How are you? Say hi, dear. <laughs> what grade are you in? <laughs> What's your name? Oh, yeah, she's a <laughs> What grade are you in? In school. And she's on Youth Voices, also. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I told. I told my students today that the motto of our school is kindergarten, so. Joe, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what's good. her name? This is Ziomara. Uh, Hi, Ziomara. So thanks for saying hello, Ziomara. Hi, Ziomara. Hard to act to follow, but go ahead. <laughs> it is a hard act to follow. So plug for Lifelong Kindergarten, MIT yeah. Media Lab. Good model. Right. <laughs> um, so we're just having a conversation in the chat about sort of the tension between all this wonderfulness and all the things we can do and and some of the constraints in formal education right now that are making some people crazy and making some people quit and making other people sort of come up with creative solutions but I just I want to um, I guess plug the informal spaces for learning for teachers and for students and just my feeling is like that all these connections and all this sort of new th all these new things that we can do means that there are lots of places that we can teach and learn and I think for me that's pretty exciting and also I'm just blown away in this last hour I'm having conversations in four different four or five different spaces with people who are in this room and people who are out of this room and it's just fabulous and I think this is such an exciting time, and it certainly is what keeps me energized to keep doing this. So thank you all for being there for me to talk to. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I am going to add one more. Um, so, so Joe, what I want to figure out what next week's show is going to be about, I think, is it's like when I saw your students work up there, I didn't know to go to your blog, or I didn't think to go to your blog to see what's the assignment, but I wanted to know what the assignment was. So how we can, like... Okay make those connections better, I think we, we need to talk about. So. Cool. Sherry. Yeah, we will. I think that's important, making those connections, like Chris said, trying to get uh, students not just commenting or reading each other's blogs, but actually maybe doing something to get something. I, I do think that that's really important. So, yes, Paul, I will be getting on Youth Voices again. I just haven't had time Super. to get that started. Well, um, I think also the issues that we're dealing with is the assessment system that we have, the pressures on teachers, the new teacher evaluation systems from the race to the top. I mean, those things are sometimes preventing teachers from being open and collaborative because they have to protect their space and their job. So. And not, a, you know, not only teachers, also, also the administrators, right? Because they they feel that pressure too. Yes, yeah. they feel yeah. that pressure also. So, hmm. how do we, you know how do we make it work so that it's it's better? So we're right in this transition period, and and it's places like this and people like you that inspired so that I don't quit. You know, so um, for my students because I worry. Um, like Joe says, my you know my students may not have access to everything, and if our school doesn't help them um, develop the skills and use them um, 
and participate actively as citizens, then what will happen to them? You know, they won't have the the equity in education is really an important issue to me. So, one of I am a middle school educator at our school, but I'm also I call the tech liaison, which means that I'm the person who goes to the IT department and the administration and says, "This is what is possible, and we need to make this happen for students and teachers." So, I think your school district needs a teacher that's the liaison between teachers and the administration that it in the places where it's blocked they could start getting things unblocked anyway that's so, my two bits <laughs> thank you for those that's great thank you and Valerie uh, you want to be the tech liaison at your district or? oh yes let's open <laughs> everything let's <laughs> train everyone right, let's, sorry. let's let's get yeah. some let's get some handbooks going about correct usage and how to stay safe and protect yourself but we'll never be able to do that unless we open stuff up and allow them to use the technology and the whole no 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 thing just really drives me crazy you know it just really does so, yeah I mean you know what I, I, I maybe it's already happening but it would be kind of a shame if the Department of Education had this whole connected educators month and never address this question, right? <laughs> I, right. Or is, so maybe it is. If it is, please let me know. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yeah. I, I mean, I really yeah. am. I think that it's, I mean, because the way I look at it, my high school kids in an English class have a duty and a responsibility to do certain things. Educate the youth is one. So they should be creating the handbooks, the how-to handbooks, and the the, the the videos and the you know everything to share with the kindergartners and the first graders and second graders so it just really drives me crazy that we're tying their hands and not allowing them to do that did you have any other last thoughts I sort of preempted your no by asking you a question okay. thank y'all <laughs> thank you let's, let's say goodbye thank, thank you. you all um, and uh, you heard some of what we're going to be talking about next week um, one of uh, say as we go out here that we have been broadcasting over the EdTech Talk um, channel of the World Bridges Network, and Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up several, many years ago. At any rate, um, thank them for all of that. Um, this is at, will be up, I promise. A lot of work in the new school. Anyway, um, at teachersteachingteachers.org as well. And it's on YouTube and all of that kind of almost immediately. So thank you all. And good night. Thank See you, you next week. Thanks, everybody. Good night. See you soon. <laughs>